Okay, it is uh, just one minute past seven. So good evening, everybody, and welcome to this careers awareness webinar. I'd like to introduce Sally from the Ambulance Service. She's going to give you a good overview of the Ambulance Service and what careers are offered. If you guys have any questions, you can either pop them in the Q&A or if you would like to, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you um, and you can ask your question directly. Uh, but I hope you guys enjoy and over to Sally. Thank you. Good evening cadets, my name's Sally. I'm actually better known down here in the Oval to our cadets as P.O. Barford. I am a sea cadet instructor as well. Obviously my main job is a paramedic with South Western Ambulance Service down here on the peninsula if you like. Um, I know there are 10 trusts nationally. We've got this, obviously the Scottish and the Welsh, there's Ireland and there's also the Republic of Ireland um, Ambulance Service as well, which I'm sure you're all aware of, plus all the other ambulance services as well. If I just give you a quick overview, I can only give you an overview of my service. Um, we actually cover down here 10,000 square miles of countryside. Most of that is rural. It's covering 5.5 million people. Um, here in Southwestern Ambulance Service, we've got 96 stations, five air ambulances, two heart areas, and we've also got a boat called the Star of Life, which is a wave saver to a uh, 1000 class ambulance boat. We, so we cover the Isles of Scilly as well, and that gets patients to and from the island. My station is actually here in Yeovil. Uh, we've got five day vehicles that start from 6.30 in the morning up until about quarter to 11 in the morning. The last one of those finishes at quarter to 10 at night. And then we've got two vehicles, that's it. Just two ambulances, which cover a lot of, a lot of Somerset from Yeovil. And we do get as far as Cornwall occasionally, it has happened. Uh, really, how did I become paramedic? So I joined the ambulance service uh, 15 years ago, 2006 I joined. When I joined, we had ambulance care assistance and I know that some of your services, they probably still do have um, patient transport. We haven't got that here anymore in Somerset, but we have got um, a paramedic support vehicle, which is run by ECAs, but I will get on to that in a moment. So I joined as an ambulance care assistant, which was just taking um, the elderly, people that had serious health conditions from very, very young to the very, very old. We used to take them into hospital for local appointments and, and back home again, which was lovely because you could speak to and meet lots and lots of people. A year later, I wanted, because I actually wanted to be a paramedic, I went front line. And we used to have, on the ambulances, we used to have a technician and a paramedic. Well, Southwestern Ambulance Service decided that they were going to do away with the technician role. So unfortunately, that wasn't open to me. But what they did replace them with was emergency care assistance, which I know a lot of your service, your local services have, I think. Some do still have technicians. I know up in Birmingham and, and around that area, they do still employ technicians on an IHCD course, which is an in-house course. My service, however, did away with that. It was an ECA um, emergency care assistant, and I did that for two years before I embarked on my paramedic journey. My paramedic journey started in 2010. Um, I started um, doing, my paramedic, doing my paramedic degree through the Open University. So I was working full time and I was doing my degree. And just on the back of that, I was working full time at that point, which could have been up to anything up to 60 hours a week. And I'm also a, a wife and mother as well. I wasn't doing sea cadets at that point, though, because there wasn't enough time. Uh, I've been really lucky. Joining, I've, I joined, like I said, in 2006, because I started my paramedic journey in 2010. And I qualified in 2014 with a foundation degree in paramedicine, which is where I've really stopped to be fair. I've been very very lucky. I've been able to fly on the air ambulance. I've flown with the search and rescue teams with the Coast Guard and I've also done a few other bits and pieces um, with our operations officers and, and I now I do a lot of the mental health, um, a lot of the mental health careers and stuff with, the, with, our, with our crews because I'm sure you can imagine the mental health of our crews is very important and it does get tested from time to time. Um, I don't really know what else to tell you about me. I mean, I'm, I'm a paramedic. Do I cry? Yeah, it happens. Do I cry lots? Sometimes. Do I enjoy my job? Absolutely. 
people say, oh, you're all heroes. Do I think I'm a hero? Absolutely not. I'm just the same as you. I'm just an ordinary person doing an extraordinary job that I really love. It's one of the best jobs out there. It really is. Yes, it's hard work. Yes, it's long hours, but you meet some amazing people along the way. So how do you become a paramedic? It's forever changing. It is always changing. Um, like I said, when I joined, uh, oh, wow, that's nice. Bridgewater Station. You have to uh, tell me who that is in the moment. Oh, yeah. Tell me who that is, Harvey. Um, so what can I tell you? It used to be Open University. It used to be going back even longer as I joined the service. We all did our paramedics actually in, in the house. So we joined as a technician and then that was a 12 week course. Then you were a technician for two years and then you did an in-house IHCD course. Please don't ask me what that stands for because I don't know, I never did it. But I know it was IHCD. If anybody's got the answers, you can tell me that one. Um, so it was in-house. So then they decided that they were going to give you a degree. So they opened up the Open University uh, route to us which I was very lucky was funded by the Strategic Health Authority. They funded it because the plan was to always have a paramedic on a vehicle with an ECA. So they wanted to get lots and lots of ECAs through the emergency care assistance. They wanted to get them up to paramedic standards so that we could have that. It all came off the back of a big report called the Bradley Report and uh, that was that was his, his vision if you like. Um, these days However, there are two ways, certainly in my service, I am so sorry, I can't answer for all of you all over the country because the services aren't like the Royal Navy or the Royal Air Force, they have their own way of doing things. They even wear different uniforms, so you may be seeing a different uniform on me tonight than your own service. My service is, has got two routes. You can join the ambulance service as an emergency care assistant. You will need to be a minimum of 18 years old and you will need a minimum of a C1 driving license, which you guys won't be getting as standard. I'm old, so I was very lucky and got my C1 with my driving license when I learned to drive 30 years ago. <laughs> you guys will, you'll get your ordinary driving license and then you will have to do a course um, to be able to drive a bigger vehicle that can tow and, and that sort of thing. So that, that will need to be done before you join as an ECA because an, I will tell you about an ECA role in just a moment. To, get, to actually join the ambulance service, you need five GCSEs. Uh, I don't know what you guys call it. I think it's grades nine to four. I'm, again, because I'm that little bit older than you, we did, we did grades A to C. So, but I think for you, for you guys, it's, it's grades nine to four in five GCSEs, including English, maths, and a science. Biology is a great science. I think a lot of you do combined science, maybe with physics, chemistry and biology, but a science nonetheless. So you've looked at joining as an ECA, an emergency care assistant, for example, starting at the bottom, the emergency care assistant is there to drive. They get the best job. That is definitely one of the better jobs. So they get to drive. They are my eyes my ears and my my right hand person they keep me when i'm dealing with something really stressful they give me the drugs they sort the drugs out they make sure everything in the vehicle works they make sure all of the um, life-saving equipment works and even the little bits like thermometers blood pressure cuffs um, we have a mobi med screen which is um, the heart monitor if you like again i think different services have different things some have shillers some have the life pack 14 um, and various different things, but it, that depends on the service. But the ECA will sort that out. So you're an ECA, you decide you want to go through to paramedic. Again, in my service down here in the Southwest, we have, um, we have a, a programme that's being run at UWE, which is the University of the West of England. And they do that and work at the same time. I have got a, a colleague of mine, a very good friend of mine, has actually done you a little, um, he's done you a little video because he's just qualified as a paramedic from joining the ambulance service um, as an ECA. So if you're happy, 
I am, I'm going to try and share it. I can't promise it's going to work. We did try it earlier, but I will have a look and see if I can find it for you. Oh, oh, you've gone. Wait one. I know you can still see me and you're going to see me pulling faces now while I try and sort this out. <laughs> so I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to go to there. And then I'm going to go to, I don't know where he's gone. There you go, just to show you what fun we have. I don't know if you can see that while I find Mike's video. So that's me with a couple of my colleagues. This young lady here, she's, she was my student and she qualified. She was at university. She qualified and did really, really well. Right, I'm going to stop sharing that now because that's embarrassing. <laughs> Let me just have a quick look and see if I can find Mike's video because I don't know where he's gone. Oh, there he is. Well, I found him. Let me have a look. Are you sitting comfortably? So let's have a let's have a quick go and see if I can share. I can't share him from there. That's not good, is it? What about that one? That one? Can you guys see that? can't play it yeah we can see it I, yeah i can't play it though for some reason not sure why oh there's amy oh, oh there you go emergency camp system and that's currently the south of San Andreas with Roger Malone to come into the service as a frontline NHS staff. Um, that involved five weeks of uh, job training and three weeks of work training to enable us to be aboard the food boats. Um, the role briefly is um, just to support the clinician so you have to have a good understanding of all the equipment that you have in the vehicle um, and be able to set that equipment up ready for use, um, things like uh, cameras with flashes, um, ready for trips and tubes so you can access the cameras and um, background masks for resuscitation, um, being able to use all the vehicles, uh, uh, the equipment for example, to make sure the battery is charged and set up correctly. Um, after nine months of doing this role, um, I was then advised by one of the training officers to apply for the degree, um, which was kept in Turkey at the time. Um, that was a two and a half year degree with um, the University of West Kingdom. Um, I was successful in my application. It was a course where we had to give up. 40 hours to be able to attend. So I was working full time as an ECA with the Indian service, and then on average three days a month, I was having to take days off and to travel across the world and to provide take in lectures and um, skills training to enable me to pass the skills exams. Um, and lectures would be to advisors of the course content um, and uh, anatomy and physiology, um, for example. Um, whilst taking on a course, working full time, um, with very few days at the university, a lot of the learning took place at home. Um, we had access to the entire course, which we had um, cost, um, and we were expected to put in around 10, 10 to 20 hours a week um, of self guided learning in that subject area that we still had to take home at all. Um, as the course progressed, we spent less days at university. Um, most of the days we normally get bored and we spent on placements. Um, in that particular course, we did placements with um, theatres. So we spent a week in the Brighton theatres doing the away match, and then we spent a week with uh, obstetrics, um, so a maternity unit working live births, and we spent a week with uh, paediatric and the um, children's A&E for the paediatric assessment unit, which is um, the property centre where children can go if they're unwell, but the A&E is not really suited for them. Um, after these placements, um, we're then signed up on mentors as being competent. Um, 
So that was Mike. He qualified and he actually registered two days ago, three days ago, which he texted me and told me he was over the moon about. So that was that's the way, one way of joining the ambulance service and becoming a paramedic. Like Mike said, it's hard work. You're studying full time, you're working full time, but you meet a lot of friends and you get a lot of support along the way. The other way, which is probably probably easier if you like is to to go to college which i'm sure a lot of you are at the moment you're in college i don't know what you're all studying um one of the sciences anything like that is really good uh health and so health and social care is actually a very good way of doing it as well um my daughter actually did it and her best friend is actually quali is qualifying as a paramedic now uh, go to university when you go to university straight from college you go to university and you come out in blocks so you go to university for i think six weeks i think it is and you learn certain skills and you learn lots of it like anatomy and physiology you learn how to talk to a patient you learn um pathways and direct pathways and how where we send people so you do that for six weeks and then you come out and you're actually assigned to an ambulance station and you get a named mentor i have a young lady called neve currently she's a year one paramedic and so she's in her first year she has to do three years it's a three-year course now I, I i believe that's the same all over the uk but it's a three-year course and you come out with us on the ambulances so there's three of us on board unfortunately the student does get shoved in the back so you will need to take lots of anti-sickness but the kids come out and they um and they love it they become part of the team they learn how the ambulance works eventually we do let them come up the front and play with all the computers and the blue lights and the sirens and, and everything else which to be fair is a, a lovely novelty and it's great to see them progressing i enjoy having a student i know that all of my colleagues enjoy very much having a student out with us it reaffirms what we know as well because every day is a learning day even for me I, like i said i've been doing this 15 years now and every day I learn something new. Sometimes it's even from the students because they've learned a different way of doing something, which is actually probably better than what we do. Um, other than that, there's not really a huge amount I can tell you, but by, if by all means in a minute, we will ask all the questions, okay? Um, I know this is a little bit difficult for you. I did have my colleague, like I said, coming from the air ambulance. So I can tell you a little bit about the air ambulance we've got so we've got here in the southwest like i said we've got 96 stations in the southwest we've got five air ambulance that five air ambulance bases my nearest one here is in henstridge like i said i'm lucky enough to fly on that because when i did my paramedic degree my mentor was air crew so i managed to fly quite a bit with him and learn some really good skills like i said again though i was in house so it was slightly different uh, we've got the two heart teams. Heart teams are paramedics. They're all paramedics, but they've got lots of different skills. They're trained to work at height. They're trained to work in confined spaces. I mean, for example, if, the, if a house collapsed, not that they collapse all the time, but if a house collapsed, us as land crews wouldn't be allowed to go in that house. So they, the heart team, which is called, they're called the heart teams, it's the hazardous area response team. They deal with things like that. They're trained to work with the fire brigade and get aid to the patient that's actually trapped. And the same if we have um, water incidents, if we've got people where there's lots of water, it's involving water or they have to go into the water on a boat, they generally, they're the ones that get the joy of that, unfortunately. We stand on the side and wait for them to bring, us, bring the patient to us. 
So that's hazardous area response team. And again, if there's an explosion or anything like that, big fires. We had a big fire here recently in, in, um, in our area. And whilst there were land crews there, the land crews were for the fire brigade to look after them. And the hazardous area response team, the heart team, they came in and they do their Gucci stuff and they managed to get in amongst it all. Those two bases, whilst we're here in Yeovil, are two nearest stations for the heart team. One is in Exeter, just outside Exeter, and the other one is in Bristol, which coincidentally is where our two control units are as well. So our ambulance control control all of these stations, all 96 stations, and all of the vehicles that are in those stations are controlled from a massive great building. Um, one is down in Exeter and we have one up in Bristol as well, that do the north because we cover from Costa right down to the Isles of Scilly. We're covered here in Yeovil, we're covered by Exeter. So when you make a 999 call, or anybody makes a 999 call, that call goes into our control unit. It's taken by a call taker, which is one of the roles that you can do with the ambulance service. You can actually be a call taker and take those initial 999 calls. I have to tell you, it's not personally a job I could do because that's got to be really hard because they're listening to distressed people on the other end of the phone and they, um, sadly they do take abuse occasionally. So they take the call and whilst they're taking the call they're tapping away on their keyboards and as soon as they have your address that then gets pinged off to our dispatchers. Again another role that you could do. It's not all about being paramedics so that then goes off to, um, that, goes, that goes across to their computer. Their computer looks to see where the nearest ambulance is and they have a big um, map on their screens with lots of dots on it and each dot represents where an ambulance is. They will then ping that ambulance off to the job. So those two roles, massively important because without those two roles, the ambulances don't even know where, where to go. So they've pinged that off. The job then comes to us on a screen and we also got pages. We've got um, the radios, I'm sure you've seen it. All the police have got them. We use the same, we use the same airwaves system as the police do so we can communicate with them if we need to as well. That then pings us off, we'll get in the ambulance and we'll start driving towards the job. Sometimes on blue lights and sirens, sometimes not, it depends on the category of call. Um, we have lots of different categories, we go one to five. Um, category one is your most serious, so your, your breathing difficulties, your heart attacks, your strokes and sadly cardiac arrest as well. But the nice one is babies as well, when the lady's in labour. Um, they, they are category one as well. Also severe bleeding and, and trauma can be category one depending on how severe it is in the call. Category two calls, that, sorry, category one is blue lights and sirens, obviously. Category two is also lights and sirens jobs. That can be anybody, anything from um, anaphylactic reactions to, again, someone having a stroke, depending on the severity of the stroke. Um, lots of other things do come into that as well. There's lots of different, but it goes to triage system and it might come in as a category one and then it might get down triaged, but we're still going. Okay, then category three are for people that may have fallen over, can't get themselves up, for example, uh, or somebody that's fallen over and broken their wrist, perhaps, or sprained, sprained their back. Um, because it's not life-threatening, it's painful, but it's not life-threatening, so that will get triaged as, a, as category three. That's down to us whether we choose to go on lights and sirens or not. Uh, then we go down to categories fours and fives. Fours and fives, we have an in-house doctor, he can deal with that, so he works a lot of the time at weekends, or they can even get triaged out to the 111 or your own GP, so we can do that as well. Not all of the calls come to us. So we've done, the, we've done the call takers, we've done the dispatchers, we've done the crews, we've covered air ambulance. However, air ambulance, I will just quickly tell you about them. Air ambulance initially were ordinary paramedics. They were road crew, the same as I am, but they've done an enhanced skill. Obviously they have to get, their, they have to get all their safety systems and everything with the helicopter because there's a lot of things going on. They've got a whizzy thing on the top that doesn't do you a lot of good if it catches your head. Um, they also do some specialist training, they're critical care paramedics, so they can do quite a bit lot more than I can. They can do surgical airways, for example. They've got a doctor on board, that's crewed typically with two, with two paramedics and a doctor, because they can put people to sleep at the side of a road at an accident, and they can, um, what we call RSI, which is rapid sequence induction, and they, 
they can put a patient to sleep and put them in an induced coma so that they can fly them safely to the nearest hospital. Typically for them here, it's Taunton and uh, Southmead are the two they go to typically from here. Occasionally they might go to Southampton or Bournemouth as well. The heart team, we've covered them. They do all the, they do all the exciting stuff, going up in heights, going out in the water, going in um, cross buildings, big fires, things like that. They do all that sort of stuff. But then behind all of that, we've got the operations officers and all the managers. The operational officers, they are paramedics. They've done road time. This is as you progress up the ladder, it's management. And they get to look after us. They, get, they look after us, they look after our well-being. If we go to a particularly unhappy job, they will come out and I don't know about most stations, but I know our ops officer brings out chocolate, which is always good after a rubbish job. And we have a bit of a debrief. We've got other roles as well. Um, you've got uh, you've got the, the bronze, they're the bronze commanders. Then we've got silver commanders, which look after the counties. They have specific counties to look after. And pretty much, that's most of it because the rest of it, if you want to progress on, you need to be a paramedic for. Obviously, we have office staff that are non-clinical, um, but I think we're talking about being frontline, but that's absolutely it, really. I know you're all going to ask me about pay. So when you start as an emergency care assistant, if that's the way you want to do it and come in and get some experience before you go on to be a paramedic, pay for a uh, pay for an ECA starts at, I have it here somewhere, uh, it's £19,337. That's full time and you get enhancements on top of that. So you do get extra pay for working nights, weekends, bank holidays, etc. So an ECA, if you want to look it up, if you go onto the NHS website and look up pay scales, uh, an ECA comes in at band three. So you will start on band three on the NHS pay scale, like I said, which is 19,337. Uh, sorry, 19,737. When you qualify as a paramedic, after you've done all that really hard training, but had a lot of fun along the way, for a newly qualified paramedic, they go on to pay band five. Pay band five starts at 24,907. Again, there are enhancements for there's enhancements for day um, for late nights, weekends, bank holidays, and so forth. And then once you've qualified, you have to be a newly qualified paramedic for two years. That means you have to validate. You have to phone up a validator to make sure that everything is to make sure you're safe and that your clinical decision making is is enhanced and that it's all good. Once you're qualified, that's when the money starts really rocketing up. So a band six paramedic, their basic pay is £31,365. Again, you get the enhancements on top of that. Again, for nights, weekends, bank holidays and late shifts. And they class a late, a late shift, believe it or not, from 9.30 in the morning. So anything after 9.30 in the morning comes in and that's a, that's a late shift and you'll get enhancements for that as well, potentially, depending on your service, of course. I am on a, an older pay scale, so I actually get 25% of my annual salary. I get 25% overall. So what I earn at the moment as I've gone up through the pay scale, I actually get 25% of that again on top of my wages. So, but I am only part time. So that's pretty much because I know you guys are going to ask me that question because that one's really important. But do you know what? We don't do it for the money. It's a job you want to do because you want to do it and that's pretty much all I can say. So I enjoy being a paramedic. I really hope that you guys want to join the ambulance service, I really do. And um, whether you're a call taker, whether you're a dispatch or whether you go on and you do your paramedic degree and go on and be an enhanced clinician and go on to the air ambulance or even go on to be doctors with the service, I really wish you all the very best. And if you've got any questions, now's the time to ask him because I've actually run out of stuff to tell you unless you've got the questions to actually ask me. Um, I've, I've actually got a question for you just oh. <laughs> to start it off sort of. Um, just want to know what sort of a typical day looks like if there is one or if sort of there isn't one but sort of what kind of thing can you know anybody expect? 
I'm not expecting. <laughs> Yeah, so a typical day, I mean, our shifts, <clears throat> excuse me, our shifts are 12 hours minimum, because we start at, the earliest we start is six o'clock in the morning. And yes, they are, they are quite typical. And it's when you get the non-typical days that it kind of makes things a little bit more interesting. So a typical day would be, I mean, we, we turn up in the morning, we have 15 minutes to check our vehicle. So we have to, we have to get the drugs because we have to sign drugs in and out. So we pick up the bag, we go into the drugstore, we get the bags. Uh, and so my job as paramedic is to get the drugs. I have to get morphine, which is personal issue. And we have to carry a book. There we go. We carry a book. With, uh, we have to fill out every time. Every time we take morphine out. So I don't know if you can see that, but that's my morphine book. And we have to fill that every time we take morphine out, every time we administer it, etc. And whilst I'm doing that, the emergency care assistant is checking the vehicle, making sure we've got all the kit, making sure everything works, making sure all the lights work on the, and make sure the sirens work. So every now and then you'll get a, you'll hear sirens very early in the morning from your ambulance station, I should think, if they're doing their VDIs properly. <laughs> um, and then we, it's, it's non-stop. There's no two ways, but it is non-stop. We get a lot of one one calls. So we're going out to a lot, because a lot of people don't know that 999 and 111 are different. And they call 111 because they have chest pain or they've had chest pain all night, for example, and then they call 111 and then it comes to us as, as chest pain and we have to go out and we do ECGs, which is the wobbly blippy line. If all of you know all that, you've seen it on the telly, it's where the line goes across and blips across the screen, that's an ECG. And that takes a picture of your heart. Um, and it is pretty much non-stop. That's, and it's usually a lot of medical, a lot of elderly. <clears throat> it's not quite the lights and sirens, all the exciting stuff you see on casualty and, and all the other all the ambulance programs on that are on the telly. But it is it's very, very rewarding, very rewarding. And then every now and then the public throw a curveball in and we get a really exciting job and we stand there and go, oh my goodness, I don't know what to do. It's been a while since I've done a road traffic accident. <laughs> so but yeah, it's um, typically it's, it, they're very busy and it's not very often you finish on time either, to be fair. OK, uh, so we've got we've got quite a few questions that okay. have actually <laughs> come in. Um, so we've uh, basically off the back of that, we've got a couple which are what's the worst thing that you've ever had to do? Um, and sort of what's your favourite part of the job and what's your least favourite part of the job? Um, the worst thing I've ever had to do, I'm not really sure it's for cadet ears, to be fair. Well, the way I will answer that is, um, imagine your, your worst nightmare and then put the smells and tastes with it and then and, and live it. And that's pretty much it. It's not, it's a question I do get asked a lot and I never know how to answer it because I see things in my role and I'm not trying to frighten any of you because if you join you, you have to be prepared i'm not trying to frighten you but you will see things and i have seen things that i don't want to tell my family about because i don't want them to have to to live it as well we do see a lot of people that are struggling just struggling with life and there are a lot of people that decide they want they have to do something about it because they see no other way out um they're the jobs i struggle with i really struggle with them I'm not gonna lie, and they, they upset me. They're the ones I cry about. Uh, my my favourite thing to do, I love mental health. I absolutely love dealing with people that have got mental health issues because you can really, really make a difference just by talking to them. And that that's amazing. I actually I really love that part of my job. I've got two jobs that really stand out, just in case someone does ask, because I know they will. <laughs> um I've got my, the, my most memorable job was I had a 102 year old lady <clears throat> in cardiac arrest. Uh, ultimately she died, her heart had stopped. We weren't gonna start to doing anything. She was 102 and then, uh, and then we did. We worked on her for a little while because the family had started so we, we went with it. She lived, she actually woke up and after we'd done it, she'd woken up and she actually spoke to us in the hospital. I went and saw her in the hospital a, a couple of hours later and she asked me what happened. And so I said to her, I said, I think you had a funny turn at home, my love. At which point she replied to me, and I, I kid you not, she said, I think I'm still having one, dear. 
which was lovely. I love that. And I've also, and that made it, yeah, that makes the job worthwhile. And I've had two or three babies in the back of the ambulance as well, which are a bit messy, but lovely nonetheless. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, we do. We actually have a hand raised from Har Harvey and Charlie Scott. So I'm going to ask your dad, Tony. I'm going to allow them to talk because I think they really want oh, to yeah. say something to you. One moment. No worries. Hello, boys. Oh. Hello. Just asking them to unmute. Oh. Hey, Morning. hello boys. Hi. Good. So who's dad then? Is it Tony? Yeah, it's Tony. <laughs> I haven't I haven't actually seen him on the road yet, but I, I know he works with us. So I have spoken to your dad a couple of times. Mummy is also a mental health nurse. Is she? Well that's yeah. good. That's really good. Well, you tell your dad that I will see him on the road at some point and I was actually in Musgrove Park Hospital the other day so uh, I was in Musgrove the other day and I didn't bump into him sadly but it was four o'clock in the morning so yeah. I'm sure he was tucked up in bed nice and asleep. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Oh lovely. Right so um, we have another one from a cadet called Ruby uh, and they are doing a T and I think a T level um, in health and social care in college. Yeah. They're just asking if you think this is a good course to go on if they want to be a paramedic. I don't think it would hurt. I don't, I don't think it hurts. I mean, obviously I didn't, I didn't do anything like that. I know that my daughter Abby did um, health and social care level three, but she's, she's going on to the Royal Navy to be a nurse. So um, the T level, I think the T level is just as good as any if because if it gives you access to university and to the university course i don't think it would be too much of an issue at all so yeah it's a good thing i'm sure i'm just gonna turn this light on it's getting very dark sorry two seconds <laughs> there we go oh hello <laughs> it's got um, dark we have another one which is uh this is quite specific <laughs> so, um i want to join the ambulance service but i've made the the decision that I don't want to do the university time. I am okay. doing social work and healthcare at college at the moment. Would going into the transport road be the best start? I am 16, so I would have to wait a few years, but they were just wondering what your advice would be. I think, what were we doing at college, sorry? Health, health and social care. Health and social care, yeah. No, yeah, that's brilliant. That, that's an absolutely brilliant thing to do. So, health and social care, if any of you haven't started your college yet, it's a really good course to get on to the T level that I think Ruby was saying she was doing. That's a good one as well. So absolutely. So you can join us as soon as you can drive. Um, as soon as you can drive and you've got your your driving license, I think think you might have to wait for a year. You might have to give it a year's driving experience before you can do your C1 driving license because our vehicles are five and a half tons. So you have to be able to drive a vehicle that's heavy. Um, they are changing a lot of our vehicles, to be fair. Certainly here, because we've got the Mercedes, we've got the Mercedes um, vehicles, which is the big box ambulances. And I know a lot of the services actually have the Fiat Ducatos, which are smaller and lighter and better for getting down thin lanes, which is why we're going to them as well, because we're very rural here. Um, so you need to get your C1 driving license. And then once you've got that, finish your course at college, get your C1 drive, get your driving, and then your C1 driving, and then apply to your, to your local services and emergency care assistant, if your service is doing that. I think most of them are now, but you will have to check, but you'll have to look at your local service website and they'll tell you. But yeah, absolutely, you're doing the right thing. But as soon as you can, drive, and then get your C1 driving license and apply for the service as an ECA. Amazing. Um, and what GCSEs do you need to become, to go into the paramedic field? So you need to have five GCSEs, grade nine to four, I think I said earlier, um, which is A to C old school. So you, I think grade four is, I think grade four is the lowest for the children now, isn't it? And then it goes up to grade nine, or is it the other way around? But anyway, yeah, nine to four, I think. I've written it down. Let me double check. So I'm not giving you lies. Uh, yeah, so you'll need a minimum of grades nine to four. And you'll need five GCSEs, 
one is English, one is maths, and you will need a science as well. Um, if you're going to go on to A level, or um, if you're going to go on to university, you'll probably need A levels or a level three qualification, which is with the health and social care. But that's if you're going to go via the university route. Um, and that, but not necessarily, you don't have to do that. Like I said, you can join as an ECA. It's just if you go the other route through the university, it does open up. Uh, it opens up a lot more doors for you a lot quicker. That's all. Um, and how much knowledge do you have to know about the body and its anatomy to to be a paramedic? Enough. <laughs> it's that's a difficult one because I'm still learning. I'm still learning every day. We we actually have we have requalification every year. We have to do a requalification, and every year they tell us a little bit more. I don't know what the students, because I've not done the university route, as in gone to university, like my colleague Mike that you saw earlier, I didn't do it that way. So a lot of mine has just been learnt on a lot, most of mine was, was an online course, it was an open university course, so I've learnt it from being on the job, doing my training days with the service and stuff. So a and Anatomy and Physiology, is a really good thing to, if you can get your head around it now, it will help you in the future if you want to be a paramedic, definitely. But it's good. It's a good thing to know. It's good to know. You need to know what the heart and lungs are, really, and the, what the stomach does and what the heart does and everything else, and, it's, uh, and what needs to be kept going. So that's really important. So if you guys are doing health and social care, you, you'll learn that anyway, if you do that. Okay. Um, and a random one for you. <laughs> I like random. <laughs> How much does an ambulance cost? £110,000. Straight up. <laughs> it's a, yeah, I knew that one because someone else asked me that the other day. So the, <laughs> so the Mercedes Sprinters that ours are based on, um, I think that actually, I think the Mercedes Sprinters are £130,000, fully kitted, um, because they just, can't, they just cost so much money. The kit is really expensive. I mean, each item of, each item of kit on the trucks, um, our movie meds like i said we use the computer screens um they are like a, they look like an etch -a sketch that's the only way i can describe it and that does everything and they're thirty thousand pounds on their own the the aeds which you guys i'm hoping have all done your first aid you will have been trained in using the shock box or the defibrillator and um, but ours are ours are triphasic and biphasic and they they cost they cost in excess of about fifteen thousand pound so yeah that's they're very expensive kitted i don't know what they cost without the kit on though i'm afraid sorry um and do you ever uh go in sort of one of the emergency response cars or do you generally just stay I, in the ambulance i do i do down here we've got the we've got the skoda octavia scout um they are incredibly quick and they they do that they're, they're not used as much as they should be but they are there. Yeah, I do, and they they are they're fast to drive, but they're quite cramped because we've got exactly the same kit in the car as what we've got on the vehicles. Except obviously we don't treat the patient. The only thing we haven't got is the trolley and a scoop and a rescue board. That's the only three things we haven't got in the car. The rest of it is in the car. But yeah, I I do, and and it's it's a slightly different beast because you're on your own. You haven't got someone helping you, and you are putting yourself out there on your own. So, but it's good fun. I I enjoy the car. Um, and do you, once you've gained your C1 license, do you need to retake your C1 to no. uh, drive an ambulance? So once you've got it once, is that it? No, so your C1 driving license, well, so you, you do your driving license, then you get your C1 driving license. And then when you join the ambulance service, I, Mike was saying on his video earlier, you do a five week clinical course to be an ECA. This is to be an ECA. So you do a five week clinical course and then you do a three week intensive blue light driving course and the service put you through that or our service do. Again, please check with your own service um, what they do. But once you've got your C1 driving license, you've got that for life and the blue light driving will be provided by, by your local ambulance service when, you, when you're successful and you become an ECA or paramedic. Although I think it's I think if you're at university, I think you do have to pay for your blue light driving maybe, but I think the service help you out and you just give them shifts back in return for the blue light drive. All right, okay, and we've got a couple more. Um, we've got maybe one that might be slightly, slightly morbid, but <laughs> what happens if you don't reach a patient in time? It depends what's wrong with the patient, really, to be honest. Um, it does happen. 
occasionally, I'm afraid. I, mean, I was telling you earlier, we're quite a large town here in Yeovil, and overnight we have two ambulances on. That's, that's all we've got on, and occasionally they will put out. So what they do is our control will put what they call an open broadcast out, and, they, and it will say, all cruises in the Somerset area, please stand by for general broadcast. They will then say, we have a category one call in Somerton, for example, which is 10 miles away from here. Um, the nearest DCA, which is double crewed ambulance, the nearest DCA has got a run time of 40 minutes. Any crews closer, please clear and contact control by priority speech. So, and that's an effort to get another crew that's closer to that patient because they may be dealing with a patient around the corner that they were just about to clear from or they were going to leave at home or that could be left at home and they can go back later. But that's unfortunately sometimes it does happen. It does happen. We try not to, and, and we're pretty good at not doing it, but I'm afraid it, it does happen sometimes because there's, the call demand is just too high. I'm sorry, does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and have you ever had to attend to a beach to transfer a patient to the hospital from the, from the beach? Uh, I haven't personally. I've not personally, but I do know several of my colleagues because I was actually based at Dorchester Ambulance Station at one point, And I do know many of the crews used to get down to Weymouth quite a bit, especially during the summer, because they've got a pier down there that children like to jump off of. I'm guessing that's from someone that probably <laughs> has needed an ambulance on the beach, but we won't go there. <laughs> um, and then we've got just a couple more in regards to uh, sort of like little qualifications and stuff yeah. um, in that they're doing a GCSE PE. Will that help in becoming a paramedic? It's not, unfortunately, it's not really one of the sciences. I mean, you do, you could do, you could do, yeah, I think you probably need a science. I, I mean, it will go towards one of your five because you need English, maths, a science and two others. So PE would absolutely be one of the five. Absolutely. But if you're not doing a science, I mean, you could do with really doing a science if you can. And if not, try and do health and social care at, at college. If you're doing your GCSEs, that's my advice to you on that one. Um, and then we've got just a, a random one. And uh, do the students get paid on the three year course? No, I'm afraid not. So when you go to university, you'll get your bursary like everybody else. Um, you, cause, so when you go to university, it's you have to pay your you have to pay your university fees. I think currently they're currently they're quite expensive. I think they're, they're nine thousand per year. It's a standard price, I think. For it's not per course. It's a standard a standard burst. But there are bursaries and there's loans for loans for people that need it and, and things like that. But the um, but the students come out with us. They don't get paid because it, it's forming part of their course. So it is part of their course, as if they were doing it in university but it's just being farmed out to us that they get the practical hands-on skills because you can't have lots of ambulances run, running around on blue lights in a university campus. So I'm afraid not, no, you will land up, you will land up needing a loan or being able to, if you're lucky enough that your parents can help you out, then it's going to be a case of that, I'm afraid, like any university course. Okay, and just uh, one final one about uh, GCSEs again. <laughs> Uh, for GCSEs, do you need the triple science or a double one, or do you just have to just do anything to do with science? Anything sciencey, anything sciencey, because I, I know that I know that a lot of the uh, a lot of the schools do the triple science. I think, and there's some do um, and some do separate. I think some do separate physics, chemistry, and biology, and then some are combine it. And so, no, as long as you've got one of them, biology is a pretty good one, though. Just a bit of a tip. So if you've got biology, that would be really good. But physics and chemistry, just as, just as good. Or all the combined is even better. All right, amazing. I think that is just about it. Um, I don't think we've got any other questions going on. We've just got a couple in the chat about wanting to join the fire service. I was just looking in the chat. Yeah, I, yeah, and if... I want to join the fire service. Will the ambulance help the firefighters? We have, I, I have got a picture I can show you, um, if I can find it, so just bear with me a second. So we do, we do do a lot with the fire service. And if I can get this one up, I don't know if I can be able to share it with you actually. Let me see if I can share this. Do, 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 do. You can't see that, can you? 
you don't really see that, I don't think. Let me come back to you. Because we do, um, in answer to your question, in answer to your question, here we go. Um, there's my fire service friends. So there you go. That's me there. Can you guys see that? I'm guessing you can. So these are ambulance staff here. We do a lot with the fire service. We do a lot of training because we have to work. We have to work really hard with them because they they get the people out while we're looking after the people in the ambulance in the crash cars, for example. We're looking after them, and then these guys are getting them out for us. So we work in close conjunction with them. So there we go. Amazing. And we've, I was going to say, we've had another one slipping at the end. <laughs> That's <laughs> uh, going. Uh, do you spend a lot of time in hospital or do you spend a lot of time? Me in personally? Ambulance. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do, we do, yes. Because typically if people are calling, if people are calling an ambulance, um, we do tend to take, not, not all of them, if they can be left at home, we will. But yes, we do spend quite a bit of time in hospital. We do have some really great friends um, in there. And um, the, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's where we go. And we do use other pathways now as well. We're referring lots of people back to their GPs. We can treat on scene certain things and we can refer them to different pathways and the mental health we can deal with in, in different ways as well. But yes, we do spend a lot of time in hospitals and I'd like to say it's mainly drinking tea, but it's not, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and then we just got another one about your shifts and the breaks. Do you get breaks on your shifts and how, how long are they? We do. So it depends on how long our shift is. Um, if, we, if you're doing a 10 hour shift, you get one half an hour break. If you're doing an 11 or 12 hour shift, you get two half an hour breaks. And I think our first on a 12 hour shift, which is typically what most ambulance services do. So we do 12 hours and then we get a break between the third and fifth hour. So we have a, a, a we have a, a window, if you like, of three to five we have our first break and then between seven and nine we have our second break our seven to nine hours into the shift not not the time so yes we get we get we get an hour throughout a 12 hour shift we're, we're supposed to get an hour there are times occasionally when it doesn't happen you get your first but not your second you can claim overtime for that that time and a half so that's okay again that might just be my service but that's how we do it anybody else all right i think that is just about it. Let's. Uh... Uh, any other questions or anybody like to say anything? If you would like to, just raise your hand um, and sort of, yeah, we can unmute you. We've got one here. Do I get a discount? Do you get any discount? <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> yes, we do. So we have, a, we have the blue light card and many people can get it. Actually, carers, nurses and stuff, they can apply for it as well. But yes, we do. We do get, uh, we not, it's not huge. It's sort of 2% sort of or 5%. We are very lucky, especially, I'm sure you guys have all seen it. If you're on Facebook, you've got the hit the ambulance gamers and, and things like that. We have been very, very, very lucky, very lucky that people are buying us tea and coffee if we stop at a shop and they buy us cakes and stuff. So, but yes, we do, do get discounts, but uh, it's not huge. It's, but the same as, it's the same as the armed forces as well. They get discount too. Ooh, uh, we got, uh, coming in now. I was going to say a very random one. Is it true that most paramedics on their breaks go to McDonald's? <laughs> oh, maybe. <laughs> no, we on the whole we're quite healthy actually. We are we are quite healthy because it's um, we we either take food with us because we don't know where we're going to get our break. So we could be. I mean, I I went to I actually went down to Durriford the other day from Yeovil on a transfer. And we had no food. So I have to confess, I may have indulged in a McDonald's then because we went all the way to Derriford down in Plymouth from Yeovil, which is a two and a half hour drive. And that was on blue lights. <laughs> so yeah, it, it does happen. But we will go anywhere wherever there's food. We know all the good eateries. <laughs> Anything right. else? Any more for any more? I think that's yeah any other final questions or anyone want to say anything just give him a few minutes in yeah case. so I don't be shy I'm happy to answer the question oh there's another one what was that one say oh, they're just saying thank you oh you're very welcome you are very welcome 
The only advice I give to you is I don't know, I, I wasn't aware that this was national. <laughs> However, get in touch with it if you want to. If you go onto your local ambulance service, I think in Scotland it's obviously the Scottish Ambulance Service, same with the Welsh. If you look at their website, if you just put Welsh Ambulance, Scottish Ambulance, or I think for you guys over in the East, it's CCAM over in sort of like Essex Way. You've got CCAM, you've got SCAS. There's, like I said, there's lots of, there's 10 different ambulance services, but you must, you will know your local ambulance service. Look on their website and it will tell you everything you need to know about recruitment. Um, and just final, one final one, I think they've slipped it in, so we might as well. That's right. um, and as it has obviously been a very tough and strange year, have you been working throughout the pandemic and how has it been for you? Yes, I have. Um, like I said to you guys earlier, I'm, I am part time. And that, that was for personal reasons several years ago that I decided to go part time. So it's not been too bad for me. I'm not going to lie. I think all of us, when, when COVID kicked off, and I know it's really tough for you, all of you, it's really, really tough. Um, for us, when it all kicked off, it was, it was really, it was mind bending. It was absolutely mind blowing. Um, we were scared. I'm not going to lie. I think we all were, to be fair. I think you guys were as well. We were all very scared because my father actually said to me, my father fought in the Falklands War. And he said to me, I knew where my enemy was. He said, for you, it's an invisible enemy. You don't know where it is. And that's played on a lot of our minds. And they have, we've got a lot of crews that have, have struggled with their mental health as a result. But we're getting there. We are getting there. We are winning this war. And with you guys helping as well, keeping social distancing and, and keeping your hands clean. That's really important. OK. But yeah, no, I've, I've, I've struggled. But my, my crewmates have really taken the brunt of it, I'm afraid. A bit. Yeah, we're all getting there. So just stay safe, all of you guys. Thank you so much for your time this evening. And thank you everybody for attending. It has been amazing. Um, but thank you so much. And if you guys have, this recording will be on the TNA. Uh, we just got a few thank yous going on in the Q&A to you. But it's been amazing, Sally. Thank you so much. That's no problem. Sorry, I was just looking at this. Do the, I know this is random, but do the sirens get annoying? Yes. <laughs> That's the short answer, yes, very much so. <laughs> uh, all right. That's very kind, thank you for all you've done, Anonymous. I uh, love the NHS, yeah, so do we. <laughs> <laughs> if if anybody you. does have any burning questions, they want to, if you want to send an email to um, Sally, sally.barford at yeovilseekadets.com, is it? Yeah, yeovilseekadets.com. And I will try and get back to you if I can, but I will have to show another member of staff that you've asked the question. Okay. That's amazing. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, yep, yeah, I'm going to stop the webinar now. Thank you. Have a lovely evening, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. You guys. Bye. Bye.